for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Josh London, Chief Marketing Officer of IDG. IDG is the world's largest technology, media, data, and marketing services provider, reaching technology audiences in 97 countries. Historically, they're probably best known from their properties, from Computer World to Mac World and CIO Magazine. Today on the show, we talk about the shift to a global brand strategy, elevating and aggregating under the IDG umbrella, and the benefits that that's driving for the organization. Well, Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Alan. I'm glad to be here. Sure. So I would love for you to give us a little flavor of your path. Um, How did you become CMO at IDG? Um, And and kind of what were the, if you will, milestones of of your background? Yeah, I I think that's a great question. Um, I was very fortunate in that my first job out of college way back in 1994 was at an internet startup that punched way above its weight. In those days, um, people didn't necessarily even know what the internet was when you mentioned it to them. Um, and yet we were working on some really cool projects, including launching the New York Times classifieds online uh, for the first time. And uh, it gave me an appreciation of what was possible through technology. Now, I'm a literature major, and and as such, I'm always looking for trends. And this has served my marketing career really well, because when you listen uh, to customers and to the data, you find the hidden themes that tend to reveal themselves. And from a marketing point of view, you know, that, that has really been instrumental to getting me to where I am today. I've had the good fortune of working at both startups and large established media companies, including CNET, Ziff Davis, um, ZDNet, uh, Thomas Publishing. So both on the B2B and B2C side. And that's given me a real understanding of the market. And finally, you know, I've had a variety of roles on the operational side as well, from general management. I was a chief operating officer, uh, business development, or way back when, technical support, partnerships. And so all of those really give me an understanding of what goes into making a great customer experience. Hmm. Now, you've been in the process of unifying the brand at IDG making it more of a a branded house, so to speak. Um, Tell me about the challenge when you started that process. Sure. So for those who don't know IDG, we're the world's largest technology media company. Uh, We're in our 53rd year, and we uh, we have historically been a house of brands. That is to say, our market leading properties, including CIO, network world, computer world, PC world, Mac world, have really been how people have known IDG. And that served us well for many, many years. But as a result, our customers and our readers sometimes were surprised to know the depth and the breadth of all that we did offer. And so as marketing has moved from more of a brand-based sale to a brand and audience-based sale, our customers have been looking for more from their partners. And we wanted to make sure that they knew everything that IDG had to offer. And so where did you where did you start that process? I mean, it, it seemed like a daunting task as I heard it described. So the first step for us was research. We wanted to understand what our customers thought of us, what we thought of ourselves, and where the difference was. Now, historically, if you ask five people at IDG what IDG did, you'd get seven different answers. And what we wanted to make sure that we were doing was simplifying our portfolio and providing a unified front uh, in a in a consistent way so that we could present clarity to the marketplace. So we did in-depth stakeholder research internally and externally, both quantitative and qualitative, to get an understanding of 
what they thought of IDG, what, uh, where those perception gaps were, and what they were looking for in a technology media partner. And some really interesting things emerged. One of the things that uh, was, was fascinating to me, having done brand research at many companies before, was the number of times that individuals were mentioned. So they would say, John Smith is the reason that I'm with IDG because he understands the market and he understands my business. And we heard this across the world, that individuals consistently were named. And, and that personal connection, those relationships and that insight into our customer's market really set us apart. That's extremely interesting, especially when you think about your place in, in a media and information provider, right? Uh, that it's people that were making your business in the minds of those uh, customers, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly right. So with all of those, I mean, you've got all these different properties that you're trying to corral and, and bring into a holding company structure and, and an IDG brand approach. What were the phases or, or, or how did you onboard all of those various stakeholders? Right. So first we, first we identified stakeholders throughout the organization that we wanted to um, get their opinions on, again, what IDG did well and where the opportunity was, as well as start to develop some positioning territories. These weren't obviously mission statements or taglines, but really what, what did IDG feel like? In many ways, our job was to help reveal the culture of IDG versus to create a culture. The culture was there, and, and we heard that uh, we heard that from employees. We heard that from uh, we heard that from our customers. What we wanted to do, though, was make sure that we were revealing that in a way that differentiated us in the market and made IDG easier to do business with. Because we heard three things from our customers. One was their perception of us was either outdated. They thought we were, for example, a print business when we've been majority digital since 2005. They thought we were difficult to do business with. And, and that's because we had such a decentralized structure. You know, each brand or business unit had its own marketing, finance, PR, HR departments at one point, uh, and, and also um, that they were looking for an entire solution. You know, marketers increasingly are thinking globally, as you know, and so they're looking for ways to consolidate spend with partners that can offer them all of these capabilities on a global basis. And when you're in these marketing meetings, marketing strategy meetings, it's very exciting to think about a global campaign. That excitement gets ground down pretty quickly when you try, uh, when you try and put that campaign in action. When you're devising marketing strategy, especially on a global basis, it's very exciting. We're, we're now living in a borderless world where customers travel across brands and across geographic borders, and a marketer wants to reach them wherever they can find them. But that, that global ambition often gets ground down by a local or regional reality, either internal to their organization that makes uh, launching a global campaign difficult, or with their media partners. Their media partners may lack global deal IDs or have currency translation, currency and or translation issues. And so these can be, um, these, these can make it hard to do business around the world. And that's what our customers really wanted from IDG and, and what we wanted to reveal to them in our marketing. Was there any, I like the notion that your culture was already defined. You were just bringing it out. I think that's a huge help to you, right? That you're not also having to change how we, how we operate or how we, how we believe and, and do business together, but you could lean into to those ways. Did you feel that, that was as helpful as I think it would be? Absolutely. And it was daunting because we're a company of microcultures. And so we wanted to make sure that we delivered a message that was authentic first and foremost to our employees for it to resonate with our customers and our readers. So we, we gave uh, a lot of time and attention and care to making sure that, uh, that that message and that culture really revealed itself and came through in the messages. Then we rolled it out in a way that I think was uh, was really interesting. We 
uh, we engaged what we called brand ambassadors throughout the company. And these brand ambassadors were not marketers. They were people who, you know the person in every office who just bleeds that company's colors. And we identified them and sort of swore them to secrecy because we did a follow the sun uh, grand reveal. We started in Sydney, Australia. We ended in San Francisco, California. And when everyone came in to each of their offices, there was, uh, there was a package for them that had a personal gift, a series of posters, uh, a corporate brand video, some elements that supported our new brand messaging, and an IDG brand storybook. And this storybook really told as one the IDG story to our employees so that we were all singing from the same song sheet. Oh, that's great. And so, you know, you're, you're over a year into this. Um, you know, where, where are you in the process? I know this is, this is a, you reveal it, but it's a long process to actually, you know, operationalize it. So where are you today? Yeah, it, it actually moved a lot quicker than you might think, Alan. Uh, in the first 90 days, we had somewhere on the order of 98% compliance or, or consistency from a visual standpoint. Uh, That's so it great. moved really quickly. People were very excited about it and it was, it was a moment whose time had come. Now, uh, now a year into it, we, uh, we continue to present one IDG to the market. And so, you know, I talk to CMOs every day and, and when I'm talking to them about what their goals are and their pain points, they're often telling me that they're looking to target a specific audience and drive demand in another area. They want to do face-to-face -face in a third. And then they want to, um, they, they want some thought leadership. And these are all services that IDG can provide, but in the past meant going to seven different people. Now our go-to-market is much more unified. And, and as our CEO, Michael Friedenberg, always says, to be number one, you need to act as one. And so for us, that means, that means really taking a customer first approach and making sure that everything that we do is, is viewed through the lens of customer needs. Great. So, you know, where, where are you seeing those benefits of a unified global brand? You know, could you share a couple of, a couple of examples of how that, how that's coming to life? Yes, I sure can share some examples. Um, a global, uh, a global technology company recently came to us looking to change their perception in a number of countries with specific audiences. And they wanted to do this in a, uh, in a very large, very expensive campaign in a very short period of time. The first part of that is very exciting. The second part operationally is very difficult. You have, you actually have to be able to execute globally, um, in a, in a very, uh, in a very defined period. And so what they came to us for was to help them understand this audience, create a series of blogs, uh, videos, a, um, advertisements and other thought leadership pieces to help change this perception. They did a global RFP for this and, and IDG was only one of two chosen. And what was really uh, exciting for us is when they renewed the second year because we knew not only did uh, were they happy with the work but that it delivered the growth that they were looking for. And that's why customers are really coming to IDG. Marketers more than ever are being charged with driving growth in their organization. And so they're looking to IDG to leverage our media, our data, and our marketing services to deliver the growth that they're seeking. Now, you also, I think, mentioned to me a, um, a product launch that you were able to achieve in you know, all 147 countries basically overnight. Um, I mean, can you give me a little, bit, a little bit more about how that took place? And the fact that you could do that, was that the benefit of a, having this global approach? It was. IDG, uh, IDG as a global company takes a platform approach to services. And so we believe that having a consistent product line across the world makes a lot of sense, obviously localized where necessary. 
When we recently launched a product called Pipeline Activator, which I'll tell you about in a moment, we were able to launch this globally in 147 countries, as you mentioned, overnight. And that kind of scale, that virtual scale, is something that, first of all, is, is relatively new to the industry and certainly very hard to replicate in other, in other companies that I've been at. You know, in the past, it was physical scale that mattered. How many flags were in the ground? How many office locations you had? Now it's really virtual scale. How can you, how can you enter a market quickly and launch a product consistently overnight? And, and that, that was a real benefit of Pipeline Activator. What well, Pipeline Activator is, is a predictive intelligence engine that leverages IDG's first party data to show on an account-based level what accounts are most likely to consider and buy a given marketer's solutions. So it helps you filter an account, a target account list so that you can pick, uh, put your efforts against the prospects and customers that will show the greatest results. Another global launch that we had recently uh, that's coming up is called IDG Security Day. Security is on the mind of every company, particularly technology marketers, and no one, uh, no one understands this market better than IDG. And so IDG was able to launch Security Day on June 21st, 2017, again in a follow the sun uh, style where we begin it in, uh, in Asia Pacific and end it in Washington DC so that we'll be able to We'll be able to speak to the unique uh, challenges in each market while speaking consistently across the world. Now, if you think about this process, this has been a, a you know quite quite a journey for yourself, uh, you know, and the company overall. Has anything was anything surprising to you as you went through this process? Uh, there were there were some surprises. Uh, one, as I mentioned, was the number of times that individuals were mentioned. And I think this is something that we're seeing more in the marketing industry as a whole, the, the personal face of a brand, that you know the customers really own the relationship uh, with uh, the company versus the other way around. And so every point of customer experience is an important one, and that includes, of course, our salespeople and our editors, because those are, those are really the frontline staff that are, uh, that are helping our customers globally make the smartest technology purchasing decisions. Now, were there any moments where you, you know, had to make a leap of faith? You know, I know you, you did your research, you did your homework, but usually always a, an unanswered question where you just have to plow through. I'm curious, you know, w were there any of those moments where you just had to say, we're, we believe this is the right direction and we're going in that direction? Yeah, IDG... IDG marries the art and science of technology media. And so as much science as you can put against that, there's always a component of it that is creative and hard to quantify empirically, the, the art portion of it. I believe that's what we do really well, but one never knows when uh, you launch a campaign with 100% certainty how successful it's going to be, how much it will resonate with your employees, how much it will, uh, how, how much it will resonate externally. And I remember, uh, I remember the day of launch, I got an email from someone who had been at IDG for more than 25 years who said, uh, someone who was not in marketing, who sent me a message and said, you know, I've been at IDG for 27 years, and today I'm proud to represent IDG. And that, you know, that kind of feedback is, is really validating for the entire team. That's great. That's great. Well, so I want to step back now and, and really think about you as a person, uh, step back from IDG and the role there. You know, what, what fuels you? What, what drives you personally? You know, I'm naturally curious. I want to understand how things are made and why they work the way they do and, and really get under the hood and, um, and understand what, what, what their purpose is. And that has 
Um, it, it has led to, I think, a pretty interesting life for me and, and led to some interesting places in my marketing career. Uh, I think I, I tend to look at things slightly differently than uh, straight down the middle. And that, like I said, that's been, uh, that's been helpful for me. So a new question for me that I'm asking folks is what experience in your past defines or makes up who you are today? It's really a couch question. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, you know, I had the good fortune of studying in Italy uh, in a town where English really wasn't spoken. And I had to learn how to communicate very quickly in ways that were, uh, that were both verbal and nonverbal. Finally, they became verbal, but to get my point across. And, and when you're constrained like that, when you have that wall in front of you of ways that you're used to communicating with, in marketing speak, an audience that you can no longer use, it really makes you think very creatively. And I've, and I've used that experience throughout my marketing career uh, when new entrants have come into the market and, and taken market share from us, when we want to move into an area where we want to compete with an entrenched competitor, you know, you can't necessarily rely on what got you there getting you out. And so it it has been, it was a very uncomfortable period at first, but one that's <laughs> served me well uh, for, for the rest of my years. That's a great learning. You know, so what, I'm curious, what brands or companies or maybe even causes do you think others should be taking notice of today? Yeah, those are, those, those are among my favorite things to talk about. There's a couple of brands that really interest me. Um, one of them is WeWork. I, I'm, if you're not familiar with WeWork, it is a co-working space and really sort of a uh, real estate arbitrage at, at, uh, at, at its heart. What WeWork does that intrigues me so much is it's able to take a commodity that is office space, create a community around it, and as a result, uh, drive a premium for it and an emotional connection with it. And I think brands that can engender that emotional connection over something like real estate or, you know, if you look at Amazon over something like books in a way that is tangential to their core, right? It's not that Amazon has better books or better, uh, it, it has better uh, products than other retailers. It's really the customer experience that set both of those apart. I think GE is a fascinating company uh, in many ways, not the least of which is how it's transformed over the last decade, but in particular the last three to five years. Um, they, are, they are really doing some, uh, some interesting things that I think any marketer would be well advised to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I agree with you on both of those. But uh, most recently, I had Linda Boff on from GE recently, um, and she she is doing some fascinating things that you wouldn't expect a B two B marketer to be doing. So Linda's a powerhouse. Yeah, no, I g totally agree. So, um, you know, last question for you. You know, what do you see for the future of marketing? Where do you think marketing is going to go? Well, I think you know. It all comes back to data, right? And data is really the global currency. But we, we have, as an industry, more data than we know what to do with. So I think better use of data, particularly through predictive technologies, focused on target accounts. And so whether, you know, whether we call that uh, account-based marketing or target account marketing, or as we used to call it, just marketing, you know, that, that narrowing of uh, boiling the ocean to just those accounts that have the greatest potential and being able to identify them at the right time is going to be critical. And then, you know, and then authenticity. And so that means bringing in peer voices, whether those on the B2C side are our friends or people that we aspire to be like, or on the B2B side, uh, fellow users or, again, companies that, that we want to either compete with or, or ape. That that customer experience and those peer recommendations are really going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. 
Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at Atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Marketing Today.